Hello and welcome to the we Florida webinar for the release of the Health Minister's Guide on Zika. I'm Kimberly Cockle, the Associate Director for Health here in the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. We took a few minutes to make sure people could get in, so thanks for your patience. Um, today we're going to be discussing the Health Minister's Guide on Zika and the Zika Action Guide. They are designed to be used to teach your community about Zika. We are fortunate to have Dr. Anna Likos and Dr. Scott Santabinez to provide an update on the current outbreak and some basic scientific information about the Zika virus. Um, we probably won't be able to get to all of your questions today, but we would like to try. So we'll encourage you to learn more about Zika virus at the CDC website at cdc.gov backslash Zika or tweet your questions to cdc.gov or sorry, to at cdc.gov or at partners for good. You can send follow-up questions to CDC info and that email address is cdcinfo at cdc.gov. And if there happen to be media on the line, please call the CDC press office at 404-639-3286. We'll post a transcript of the call as soon as possible. For our first presentation, we're grateful to have Dr. Anna Likos with us. She's the state epidemiologist for Florida, and she's also the interim deputy secretary for health and the incident commander for Florida's response to the Zika virus. So you can imagine we're grateful to have her because she's probably quite busy. She recently retired her commission as a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force Guard, or the Air National Guard, where she served as a physician, ensuring that Air Force personnel were medically fit and ready for immediate deployment if required. Dr. Likos has extensive experience, both nationally and internationally, in fighting emerging infectious disease. She will discuss the Zika virus and the status of Zika right now in Florida. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Zika, or Dr. Likos. You can now begin. <laughs> we'll talk to Dr. Zika, too. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the introduction. And I'd like to make one small correction. I am no longer the incident commander. When we began having locally transmitted cases, I needed to focus entirely on the epidemiology. And there's so many other uh, aspects to this incident that, that uh, Mr. Wayne North is now our incident commander. So I apologize. That oh, thank I you for that correction. <laughs> sure. So I wanted to talk to you today. First of all, thank you so much and, and, and for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. As you know, Florida is on the front line in the fight against Zika, and I greatly appreciate your time this afternoon to talk about how you, as leaders in your community, can help stop Zika and protect pregnant women. Next slide, please. I'd like to start by giving you an overview of Zika virus, its history, how it's transmitted, and why we need to be concerned about this emerging public health threat. Zika virus was first discovered in the Zika forests of Uganda in 1947, actually during the course of some research on yellow fever. It was found in a monkey who was ill. The virus was isolated and noted to be different. It is, uh, uh, spread by a mosquito, specifically mosquitoes called Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus. They're very closely related mosquitoes. Um, this uh, type, these, both of these types of mosquitoes are present throughout the state of Florida. Many people with Zika infection will, will not experience any symptoms at all or may only have very mild symptoms. And this actually presents a challenge in containing the spread of the virus, virus because even, if you, even people who don't have symptoms can transmit the virus to others to mis via mosquitoes. Pregnant women are most at risk for negative impacts of Zika virus because the virus has been linked to severe birth defects, including microcephaly, when contracted by expectant mothers during pregnancy. Next slide, please. Before 2015, Zika outbreaks occurred in Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands only. Currently, however, outbreaks are occurring in many countries and territories. In December 2015, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, a United States territory, reported its first locally transmitted uh, case of Zika virus. Cases of local transmission have also been recently confirmed in two other U.S. territories of the United States, the U.S. Virgin Islands and American Samoa. 
For the most recent case counts, please visit CDC's Cases in the United States webpage. And now Zika virus has been found to be locally transmitted and reported in a very small area of Miami-Dade County right here in Florida. Next slide, please. Zika virus is spread to people primarily through the bite of an infected Aedes species of mosquito. These mosquitoes that spread Zika virus bite typically at dawn and dusk, but they can bite any time during the day and night. A pregnant woman can pass Zika virus to her fetus during pregnancy or around the time of birth, and we are studying how Zika affects pregnancies in conjunction with the CDC. To date, there are no reports of infants getting Zika through breastfeeding. Because of the benefits of breastfeeding, mothers are encouraged to breastfeed even in areas where Zika virus is found. A man with Zika virus, however, can pass it to his female or male sex partners. And there's also evidence that a female sex partner can pass Zika to a male uh, partner. There's a strong possibility that Zika virus can also be spread through blood transfusions. Next slide, please. The major symptoms of Zika are really very nonspecific. The most common symptoms are fever, rash, joint pain, and conjunctivitis or red eyes. Here in Florida, what we see predominantly is rash, and many of our patients have told us that it's an itchy rash. So we look for those specifically. And please don't think of red eyes as being very strongly red. The, a, a mild conjunctivitis tends to be the, the presenting symptom. Next slide, please. Additional symptoms include muscle pain or aches and headache. And we have been getting more reports of what is called retroorbital pain or pain behind the eyes as the type of headache that occurs. Next slide. If you live in or travel to an area with Zika, you are at risk for being infected. It is likely that once you've had Zika, you are protected from future infections as immunity develops. Symptoms typically last several days to a week at the most, and some people, as I mentioned, will not experience symptoms at all. Hospitalization is very uncommon as Zika is generally an extremely mild illness. Zika, next slide, I'm sorry. Zika is of most concern, however, to pregnant women because if a pregnant woman contracts Zika during her pregnancy, she can pass the virus to her fetus. A pregnant woman can also pass virus to her baby around the time of birth during the, the birthing process. We expect that pregnant women who develop Zika will have similar illnesses to people who are not pregnant. No evidence exists to suggest that pregnant women are more susceptible or experience more severe disease during pregnancy. We're learning a lot about Zika in the pregnant woman. The things we don't know, however, continue. For example, we do not know if pregnant women are more likely to develop symptoms compared to the general population. We don't know if pregnant women are more likely to get a neurological complication from the Zika virus uh, infection called Guillain-Barre, which has occurred in rare cases. We do not yet know how often Zika gets transmitted from a pregnant woman to her fetus either. Next slide, please. Zika infection during pregnancy can cause microcephaly and other severe fetal brain defects. Microcephaly is a birth defect that where a baby's head is smaller than expected when compared to babies of the same sex and age. Babies with microcephaly often have smaller brains that may not have developed properly. Recognizing, however, that Zika is a cause of certain birth defects does not necessarily mean that every pregnant woman infected with Zika will have a baby with microcephaly or any birth defect. It merely means that an infection with Zika during pregnancy increases the chances for these problems. There is no evidence that a previous infection will affect future pregnancies. Next slide. The most severe birth defect caused by Zika is microcephaly, but other problems can arise such as miscarriage, stillbirth, absent or poorly developed brain structures, eye defects, 
hearing def deficits and impaired growth. There are no reports to date of any infant getting Zika through breastfeeding. Next slide, please. Although Zika virus has been around a long time, since 1947, this is the first time we have had such a large scale outbreak of the disease in various countries and territories. So it feels new to those of us in the United States. At this time, there's no specific treatment for Zika virus infection, nor is there a vaccine to prevent infection in the first place. Zika patients are advised to treat their symptoms, get rest, and drink plenty of fluids. Research into a vaccine is underway, but even if everything goes very smoothly, it will be at least two years before we could see a vaccine on the market. Because a vaccine is such a long way off and Zika is not going away, it is critically important to educate the public about how to protect themselves. Next slide, please. CDC is a valuable partner in Florida's efforts to contain and prevent further spread of Zika virus. CDC has provided Florida with $9.5 million in funding specifically for Zika preparedness and response. They have provided CDC experts to assist with our investigations. And as well, they've provided Florida with supplies to expand our laboratory testing capacity and support to help process tests accurately and quickly. In addition to what CDC is doing to help Florida, they also post travel guidance, conduct studies, and educate healthcare providers and the public. Next slide, please. CDC works with states to monitor and report cases, and they assist with developing action plans for state and local health officials to improve Zika preparedness. They publish guidelines on testing and treatment of people with suspected or confirmed Zika, and public information on the link between Zika and microcephaly. Next slide, please. States report both travel associated and local cases of Zika to CDC, and CDC reports that information on their website. Florida puts out a daily Zika update every weekday in the afternoon that includes our current count of travel related cases, local cases, and the number of cases involving pregnant women. Several thousand locally acquired cases have been reported in the U.S. territories, including Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and American Samoa. As of yesterday, September 20th, Florida is the only state that has reported local transmission. Next slide, please. Florida currently has confirmed ongoing local transmission of Zika virus in about a 4.5 square mile area in Miami Beach, located between 8th Street to the south and 63rd Street to the north. This is the second area of local transmission in Miami-Dade County. The first area was in Wynwood, uh, which, and was a small, approximately one square mile area. The Wynwood zone, however, was lifted uh, the restrictions there were lifted last Monday after 45 days with no evidence of active transmission. This does not mean that Miami-Dade and, and the Wynwood area is Zika-free, however. All of Miami-Dade County remains at high risk. Miami Beach is at extremely high risk, is the way we prefer to look at it. Florida's small case cluster, however, is not considered widespread transmission. Um, at, in the state of Florida. Next slide, please. As of yesterday, September 20th, Florida has 671 travel-related cases of Zika in non-pregnant individuals. The majority of these are in Miami-Dade County, but 37 of our 67 counties have reported cases uh, of travel-related cases. We have 89 locally acquired cases in Miami are in Florida residents. In addition to this, we have 10 cases that have occurred in visitors to our state, located both internationally and in other states uh, in the, within the United States. We have 87 pregnant women that have laboratory evidence of Zika infection, and we monitor these women closely 
to determine their birth outcomes and we connect them to any services if they are needed. There are 89, I'm sorry, uh, the majority of our local cases are in Miami-Dade. The department is investigating one case in Pinellas County and three cases in Palm Beach County. The department conducts thorough investigations around each case by interviewing and testing close contacts, both at work and at home, as well as in some cases, community members that may be living in the neighborhood. This process helps the department determine if additional people are infected and knowing if additional people are infected gives us the information we need to determine if local transmission of Zika is ongoing in a specific area. The department is currently conducting 10 active investigations, six in Miami-Dade, one in Pinellas County, and three in Palm Beach County. In some cases, uh, in most cases, I'm sorry, most instances, uh, cases end up being single cases, isolated incidents with no evidence of ongoing local transmission. Next slide, please. I thank you all so much for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Likos. We appreciate um, you being with us. And we will hold uh, questions until the very end. Um, so um, but if, if folks have questions, we invite you to please um, write them in the corner of your screen. There's a little chat box um, that should be on the right hand uh, corner, kind of out at the bottom. Um, please just send your questions to us and we'll, we'll do that at the end of our call. Thanks again, Dr. Likos, and we'll look forward to hearing more from you. I'm excited uh, and grateful uh, to my colleague, Dr. Scott Santabinez, to be for being with us uh, today. Dr. Santabinez is the Associate Director for Science in CDC's Division for Preparedness in Emerging Infections. He has extensive experience working with many diverse community and faith-based organizations to promote health. In his life outside of CDC, Scott has served as a volunteer physician for over 15 years, providing primary care to underserved populations in the Atlanta area. He holds master's degrees and doctoral degrees from seminary and is active in his local congregation's community service efforts. Dr. Santa Benez is a beloved colleague of mine, and I'm grateful for his leadership, knowledge, and passion and dedication. Dr. Santa Benez will now talk about the important role health ministers play in fighting Zika. Thanks, Dr. Santa Benez. Well, thank you, Kimberly, and uh, good afternoon. And I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to participate in uh, this webinar. Um, it seems like every few years uh, we hear about a new infectious disease threat in the news. So we heard about H1N1 and Ebola and now Zika. And if you don't have a healthcare background, it can be hard to know what to make of all these news stories. And to be honest, even for those of us who do have a healthcare background, it's hard to keep up on all the new information that's always coming out uh, about uh, diseases like Zika. So you may wonder, uh, should I be concerned about uh, Zika? Well, our colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services have developed two new documents that can help you to answer this question. The first of these is a Health Minister's Guide on Zika. And this is actually one in a series of guides on a number of different health topics. And this particular guide is designed to help you, help your community understand about Zika. There's also the Zika Action Guide for Health Ministers. And this guide gives you practical information about steps that you can take about Zika in your community. On today's webinar, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to these two uh, documents. Now, I won't be able to cover everything about these, these guides, so I encourage you after the webinar to go back and read these two documents in detail. And you should also go to CDC's website, www.cdc.gov slash Zika, where you can find the most up-to-date information about Zika. So next slide, please. 
So what did the authors of the guide mean by the term health minister? Well, a health minister could be a pastor or a priest, uh, an imam, a rabbi, uh, perhaps a parish nurse who is interested in promoting health in his or her congregation. But really, this could be anyone in the community who is interested in health. So we hope this information is useful to you if you happen to be the, the leader of a faith community, but it also should be of value uh, to anyone in the community if you're interested in uh, promoting health and making your community healthier. As community leaders, you have an important role in this fight against Zika. People in your community trust you and they may come to you for advice. You understand the local culture and even more than understanding that culture, you understand the, the anxiety, uh, the concerns and worries or fears that a, a woman or a couple may have about Zika and how it might affect their pregnancy. So you can show compassion and sensitivity uh, as people uh, learn more about this disease. You may also have an important role in your community reminding people about the needs of those who are the most vulnerable among us and helping to give a voice to people who don't have a voice. So you can help your congregation and community to understand that Zika can affect the most vulnerable. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, people in your community trust you and they may come to you for advice. Now, when people uh, face a, a big life decision, um, when they go through a major event or, or even experience a tragedy, they're likely to turn to someone they trust. So, for example, this could be their, their rabbi or their pastor or their priest. And you may find that you're actually the, the first point of contact for health questions. Uh, even if that isn't your, your background or your, your uh, main uh, area of training. So um, if you're like me, when you know that people may ask you about a topic, you want to do your homework. You want to read up on that topic. You want to look at the facts for yourself so you understand uh, about that issue. So it's important to become knowledgeable about diseases like Zika. It can be a challenge, though, to know where to find reliable sources of information. And this is where the Health Minister's Guide can help you. The guide uh, explains why Zika is dangerous. It explains the role that you can take and how people can reduce their risk of getting Zika. As Dr. Likos mentioned, um, this virus was first detected in, in 1947. And uh, over the years, over the decades, there have been some smaller outbreaks, but it's only been recently that uh, this virus became more uh, widespread in South America and more recently spreading to the United States. Most people who get infected with Zika uh, won't have any symptoms at all. And even for those who uh, do get infected, the symptoms tend to be generally uh, mild and uh, they recover with some supportive care. The next slide, please. Now, the main concern is the effect that Zika can have on pregnancy. Zika infection in pregnancy can cause microcephaly and other severe fetal brain defects. So microcephaly is this condition where the brain of the, the fetus has not developed properly during pregnancy. So the baby's head is smaller than expected when compared to babies of the same sex and age. CDC and other scientists have spent many months uh, researching the question of whether Zika uh, is a cause of microcephaly. And in fact, there's been a lot of evidence and, and data uh, that uh, we found uh, over the past months of studying this. Most notably, we found evidence of the virus uh, in the brain cells of fetuses who had microcephaly. Uh, I was just, uh, just two days ago, I went over some of those slides with one of our pathologists here at CDC, and you can clearly see the viral particles uh, in those uh, brain cells. 
When we combine this with other pieces of evidence from our research, uh, it's a, a compelling case, compelling proof that Zika uh, is a cause of microcephaly. The timing that the infection occurs relative to the brain development uh, aligns and, and, and makes sense. Um, generally speaking, we know that other viruses can cause birth defects, so there's a, a biologic plausibility to it. And we've also considered uh, whether there are other potential explanations for microcephaly, other factors uh, to take into account. And um, after researching these other possibilities, uh, none of them uh, conclusively uh, showed a cause of microcephaly. So uh, there's compelling proof that the Zika infection uh, is, a, is a cause of uh, microcephaly. Well, how do we avoid microcephaly? Um, people primarily get infected with Zika virus in one of two ways. They can be bitten by a mosquito that is carrying the virus, and they can get uh, infected through sex. Next slide, please. So the easiest way to avoid being bitten by a mosquito that's carrying Zika is just to avoid those mosquitoes altogether. Uh, we recommend that pregnant women avoid travel to areas with ongoing Zika transmission. Uh, these areas with ongoing transmission can change over time, so we encourage people to uh, look at the, the CDC website where you can find information about areas with active transmission. If a pregnant woman must travel to or be in an area with Zika transmission, we recommend that she use an EPA registered insect repellent that she stay in buildings with air conditioning uh, and mosquito screens, and that she wear long sleeve shirts and long pants. Next slide, please. So in this video, we uh, can see uh, uh, a young woman who will be uh, using insect repellent to uh, prevent uh, mosquito bites. So the young woman is applying mosquito repellent to exposed areas on her feet. You can see she's wearing a uh, long sleeve shirt and uh, long pants. She's applying the repellent to her hands. And uh, also, she will apply additional repellent to her neck and her uh, face, really any uh, areas with exposed skin to prevent being bitten by mosquitoes. Now, preventing the sexual transmission of Zika, as you know, is a sensitive issue. The, the science, the research, shows us that Zika can be spread through sex. So it's very important that pregnant women understand how to prevent sexual transmission of Zika so that they have the information they need to protect their fetus. Now, how and when these discussions take place of course, depends on the local culture and the local context. So this could involve you as a health minister uh, having candid conversations with women and couples about Zika, if that's appropriate in your context. On the other hand, you could create an environment. Uh, you could invite in others, say from the health department or a local doctor or nurse or a, a health educator who could answer uh, questions that a young woman or a couple may have about Zika, uh, perhaps in, in a more private uh, setting. So, for example, um, I have a pastor friend who, when it comes to talking about uh, preventing the spread of another virus, of HIV, and my friend is really quite comfortable having candid conversations with his congregation uh, about that topic. And if that's the, the way things are in your context, then, then that's fine for you to have those conversations. However, I know other pastors who will say, uh, we're not going to talk about that subject uh, during services. It, it wouldn't be appropriate uh, in our local setting. But those same pastors will say, you know, what we would be willing to do is uh, open up our building for some meetings. Uh, we will invite in 
someone from the health department or a local doctor or, or nurse uh, who can answer questions that young women and, and couples have uh, in, in a more uh, kind of private setting. So you can have those conversations or you could help to create an environment uh, where others, doctors uh, and so forth, uh, are able to address those issues, depending on your local culture and context. An added benefit that you can have uh, as a health minister is, uh, again, understanding the anxiety, the, the fears, uh, worries, or concerns that a, a woman or a couple may have about Zika and how it can affect their pregnancy. So you can show compassion and uh, sensitivity as they learn more about this disease and uh, make important uh, decisions. The next slide, please. You can refer to the Health Minister's Guide on Zika and the CDC website for specific and detailed information about preventing sexual transmission. Keep in mind the overall goal is to prevent birth defects by educating women who are pregnant and even those who could become pregnant uh, about how to protect themselves from Zika. Decisions about pregnancy are personal, they're complex, and they're best discussed with a trusted healthcare professional. But you as a health minister can have an important role to play in this process. So for example, uh, let's say you have a pregnant woman in your congregation. Uh, she has some concerns about Zika, she has some questions, and she's wondering if she should go and talk to her doctor about this. But you, can, you can tell her that, yes, this is a serious issue, encourage her that she should definitely go talk to her doctor or nurse about this. Uh, make sure that, that she asks questions uh, and gets her questions answered. You may help her to write down her questions ahead of time to make sure that everything that she's thinking about gets, gets captured. And um, you can also help to reinforce the public health messages that that doctor or nurse uh, gives her. So you can help to um, encourage her and uh, promote those good health messages that she receives from the doctor. The next slide, please. As I mentioned, you may have an important role in your community, reminding people about the needs of those who are the most uh, vulnerable among us. So for a pregnant woman or a woman who is thinking of becoming pregnant, her pregnancy and the health of her, her fetus uh, is potentially uh, at risk from Zika. So we can see how Zika affects the most vulnerable among us, those, those infants uh, who uh, are born with microcephaly. Zika also affects vulnerable people in other ways. As I mentioned earlier, we recommend that pregnant women avoid being bitten by mosquitoes by using insect repellents by staying in buildings that have air conditioning and mosquito screens. But people who are struggling financially may not live in a house or an apartment that has air conditioning or that has mosquito screens. So it may be harder for uh, that woman to avoid being bitten by mosquitoes. In addition, uh, she could live in a part of the city that is far away from those manicured lawns and landscaping. She could live in an area where there's more debris and, and um, areas of, of standing water where mosquitoes lay their eggs. And so it may be harder for her to avoid uh, mosquito bites for that reason. So if your community is concerned about the needs who are the most vulnerable, uh, it can be important to, to remind them that Zika does uh, potentially affect the most vulnerable among us. Anytime an infant is born with microcephaly, uh, this is a tragedy, but it's particularly tragic and challenging when the family doesn't have the resources to be able to care for an infant who has these uh, special needs. The next slide, please. The Zika Action Guide for Health Ministers gives you some practical tips that you can do, activities to reduce the spread of Zika in your community. And the action guide divides these according to the phase of the, the response. And what that means is what you would do before mosquito season 
can differ from what you would do at the start of a mosquito season. And you might have different activities after a first case is, is identified in your area. Should Zika become more widespread in your area, then what you would do during uh, active mosquito transmission uh, could also be a little bit uh, different. So I encourage you to uh, read over that guide and, and uh, consider what you would do in those different uh, phases. I'm going to go over some um, basic uh, ideas uh, of things that you can do uh, next. So the next slide, please. The first thing you can do is to communicate. You can uh, share fact sheets and infographics and, and videos with people in your uh, uh, community. Um, CDC's website has a number of resources that you can use, and these are available in different languages. Um, many of them use pictures for people who may be of, of lower literacy, uh, for example. So we encourage you to use these resources and again, you're the most familiar with the communication channels that work best in your community. So we encourage you to use those channels which are most effective uh, to reach your population. The next slide, please. You can also collaborate. Uh, get to know and work with your local health department and also your local community health center. You could work together to organize educational sessions where people can learn uh, how to apply uh, insect repellents. Uh, they can learn about areas with standing water where mosquitoes lay their eggs. So uh, they know how to eliminate these areas. Um, you might also work together to have uh, educational sessions where a woman or a couple could talk to a, a doctor or a nurse or health educator uh, about preventing the sexual transmission of Zika, uh, perhaps in a more private setting, but make sure that, that they have all of their, their questions uh, answered. You could also work with local businesses and employers uh, to create a culture of health and wellness. Um, some businesses might even be willing, for example, to help install mosquito screens for uh, pregnant women who, who don't have those. So you can be creative and see what's potentially available in your local area. And in general, I think these types of collaborations, these types of relationships are gonna be useful, not just for Zika, but they'll also help you to be more prepared for any type of emergency, like a natural disaster, uh, if you're connected with these other parts of the community. The next slide, please. So another thing that you can do is help to clean up your uh, neighborhood. And as this video shows, uh, there are areas where uh, standing water collects, where mosquitoes uh, like to lay their eggs, and these are places like buckets, um, uh, animal dishes, uh, the tops of garbage cans. We see here the, the larvae um, in the uh, garbage can lid and also um, things like abandoned tires, anywhere where water collects. So you could um, organize volunteer activities where people in the community go around and clean up these areas uh, where mosquitoes could potentially uh, spread. And these efforts may resonate with people in your community because you're not only helping to prevent Zika, you're also cleaning up the neighborhood. You're helping to beautify the community. So it's an added benefit. The next slide, please. So let's review what we've discussed today. Zika is a serious health issue that can cause microcephaly and other severe fetal brain defects. You have an important role in the fight against Zika. People in your community trust you and they may come to you for advice. So you'll want to read up on the topic and make sure you've reviewed the facts and understand uh, about this uh, disease. You understand the local culture and you understand the anxiety and, and worries and fears that a woman or a couple may have about Zika and how it might affect their pregnancy. And so you can show compassion and sensitivity as people learn more about this uh, disease. You may also have a role in, in reminding your congregation and your community about the needs of those who are the most vulnerable, and you can help them to understand how Zika can affect the most vulnerable 
among us. So again, I'd, I'd like to thank you for uh, taking the time uh, to join us on this uh, webinar. And again, I encourage you to go back and read the Health Minister's Guide and the Action Guide for Health Ministers uh, closely, and also go to CDC's website where you can find the most up-to-date information about Zika. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santa Benyez. We appreciate your expertise. We'll now transition into our question and answer session. To ask a question, I was wrong last time. It's actually for you guys in the upper corner. Um, but if you'll just type your question into that chat box, um, we will direct your questions to the right panelist. Um, so let's pause just for a moment to get some questions going. And Haley, will you please let us know when you have um, our first question? Yes, we have our first question. It is from Public Affairs. And this is most appropriate for Dr. Lykos, is Florida educating citizens on how to prevent the spread of Zika through sexual contact? Florida does have information on its website that, uh, yes, we, we do include the use of condoms um, and, and having protected site. We, we follow the CDC guidelines in terms of individuals that have traveled to a to a, a location, be it Miami Beach or outside of the U.S., where ongoing Zika transmission is occurring, and so we um, follow those guidelines and encourage uh, people that are returning from travel to use condoms on, uh, for the specified period of time upon return, depending upon. Uh, if they have been diagnosed with Zika or not. Those guidelines are on our website at uh, floridahealth.gov as well as uh, the CDC website, and I encourage people to look, those, look at those, uh, those recommendations. Thank you. Our next question is from Jonathan Lynch. How do we use religious terms to motivate people to protect against Zika? And either one of you can chime in. Well, I'll um, say a few words about this, and, and uh, Dr. Likos may like to add to that. Um, I think that there are some concepts that resonate with uh, communities um, that uh, can lead them to want to take action against Zika. And one of them that I mentioned is the fact that Zika uh, potentially affects the most vulnerable people in our communities. And I think uh, people of, of various faith traditions uh, are concerned about uh, vulnerable people, about making sure that uh, these individuals are, are uh, cared for and are not at greater risk. So I think that some of these concepts um, really would resonate with various religious traditions and various faith communities. So it's important to, to remind uh, people in our congregations, in our communities, that this is an issue that, that affects uh, vulnerable uh, people. Now, specific religious terms, uh, we would look to uh, you all in as leaders in faith communities as to how that would apply in your local context, in your local uh, setting. So uh, you can get to know and, and understand the issue and see how you would communicate that in your local uh, culture. If I might add, in the state of Florida, we have a very diverse population here, uh, multiple cultures and, and languages, especially in South Florida. And so the assistance of our community leaders is absolutely essential in terms of uh, connecting with, with the, the community themselves and, and um, using the, the, the terminology that is appropriate within that culture is just so important in order to get the message across. Um, the main message being to, to uh, protect yourself from Zika and exactly how to do that. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lisa Smith. She says, I used to live near Miami. I can understand why people are worried about aerial spraying. Is aerial spraying really worth it? And Dr. Santa Benez, would you like to go first? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll speak to this issue. And um, so when I think about this question, it's, it's a very good question. And I tend to think about this as I would as a primary care physician. And so um, before we use 
any chemical, any substance uh, around people, whether that's a medication or a pesticide, uh, I want to think of two questions. Um, is there a reason for doing this? And if the answer is yes, then have we taken all the steps we can to reduce any possible risk uh, from, from using this. So I think of these questions, you know, before I would give someone, uh, you know, an over-the-counter medicine for a headache, or before I would prescribe an antibiotic for someone who has bronchitis. Um, in this case, uh, you know, is there a reason uh, for using these pesticides? Well, we've seen that um, Zika is a cause of microcephaly, and we want to prevent that. So there is a reason, a real health reason, for doing this. Um, have we then done everything we can to minimize any possible risks? The uh, types of, of pesticides used in aerial spraying are uh, things that we've had many decades of experience wow. using, um, and they've been shown to be safe and effective when they're used as, as directed. So we have a lot of experience with them. Uh, they have not uh, shown to have uh, side effects when they're used uh, properly. And even with that in mind, um, we use them only when needed. We use them as part of what we call an integrated mosquito control program. So uh, that involves some of the activities that I mentioned earlier, uh, identifying those areas of standing water where mosquitoes uh, tend to lay their eggs and cleaning up those areas. So that's part of it, using insect repellents. And we would tend to use the aerial spraying, the pesticides, only uh, when there are a, a very high number of mosquitoes and we want to rapidly reduce those to prevent disease. So uh, only um, after we've tried to use a, as much of these other uh, uh, steps as possible. So as, as much as we can, you know, is there a reason to do it and have we taken all the steps to minimize any potential risk at all? Thank you. Our next question is, the travel advisory to Wynwood was recently lifted, but the one in Miami Beach was expanded. What does this mean? What other areas are at risk? And that's to be, I assume? <laughs> yes, Dr. <Lucas. laughs> You're right. The, 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 the travel advisory in, for Wynwood was lifted on Monday. And the reason it was lifted is that 45 days since the most recent onset of symptom date had passed with no additional cases. So August 5th, there was, there was a last case there, the onset of symptoms, and that's all we have is a date to start the, the clock ticking, so to speak. In Miami Beach, the transmission, we're, we're still finding cases with more and more recent onset of symptom dates. What we found north of Miami, north of the box, that the initial box uh, for Miami Beach was that uh, we found another cluster of cases that were living fairly close to each other, had spent time in the same areas, and that were having a symptom onset that indicated that there was ongoing transmission. CDC's definition for ongoing transmission is that there are at least two cases that live within 150 meters of each other with dates of onset of symptoms two weeks apart, meaning that the time is, as enough time has passed to, between those two uh, illnesses to indicate that mosquitoes are still infected and transmitting the virus to those individuals. The location of these areas was significantly um, uh, far apart, greater than, obviously greater than 150 meters from the north boundary of the box. And so after careful consideration of all the cases in the area, the box was expanded. The clock has not started ticking for Miami Beach area as yet. We are still seeing new cases with more and more recent onset of symptom dates. So once the, uh, the mosquito population is knocked down by what other, whatever methodology we can use in the area, we will start to see fewer and fewer cases with, uh, with onset of symptom dates that are uh, later and later apart. Other areas of concern, we're always concerned about any case that we do find. As I mentioned, I believe in my talk, we do see single cases uh, that, that are throughout Miami-Dade County, and that's why I say it's the entire county is at high risk. 
we look um, everywhere. We gather a great deal of information about where these people live and where they work and where they may have even gone to a restaurant or to an outdoor party. We gather all that information and look at it very critically, trying to identify any area, additional area, where there may be ongoing transmission. There's a difference between ongoing transmission and just transmission. We frequently see, even with dengue and chikungunya, a single transmission event that is local. There's no history of travel, but it goes no further. And we are seeing that with Zika as well. Our major concern, though, are those areas of ongoing transmission, and we look very carefully for them to be able to take appropriate steps to stop the outbreak. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ebony Brooks. Can you talk more about Guillain-Barre syndrome and how it affects the body? Should health ministers be prepared to address this condition in their communities alongside existing concerns about microcephaly? So thanks for that question. Um, so Guillain-Barre syndrome is a syndrome that we uh, can see after Zika virus infection, and it can also occur after uh, a number of other types of uh, infections. And this is a condition where the body's own uh, immune system is, is reacting and causing uh, paralysis. Um, it can, depending on how quickly that spreads, uh, it could even affect a person's ability to breathe, the, the respiratory uh, muscles, and could, uh, in that case, be potentially uh, life-threatening. But most people generally recover from Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, I think that the, the occurrence after uh, Zika virus infection is, is generally uh, pretty rare, but I think it would be useful for health ministers to be aware of this as a complication. So as you learn uh, more about this disease by studying the, the health minister's guide, this is one of the, the complications that, that you can learn about as you understand more about this uh, disease. Thank you. Our next question is from Jason Wood. Once a woman has developed an immunity to Zika, are her future pregnancies safe from infection? I, I believe the, the data so far indicates that yes, that, that once a woman has become immune to Zika virus, we expect that no uh, ill effects will be present in future pregnancies. Remember though that we are, this is a new virus, we are learning more about it every day, and that, that uh, expectation can change. Thank you. Our next question is, how long can a male be a carrier of Zika? In other words, can a sexual partner get Zika from a male years from now, if they're infected? Well, that's uh, an area of ongoing research. So we're, we're continuing to learn more uh, about this, uh, continuing to, to study this. Uh, and we, um, so it's something that, that we need to continue to, to research. Um, I agree with that. <laughs> it is a, it, it's a great question. Um, we have, we have had some cases here in Florida, uh, just a couple, where we have had um, men who are infected and we've been able to demonstrate the presence of virus in the semen. We follow them on a weekly basis, thanks to our, our terrific uh, disease investigation specialists that, that engage with the individuals and they have been providing us with uh, samples over time to test for the presence of virus. We usually test until there are at least two negative samples uh, to uh, document how long the, the virus is present. To date, the, the very limited number of cases we have um, indicates that it's present in the, in the semen for uh, four to six weeks. Um, I believe there are other cases that CDC is possibly aware of, or I've been told by CDC that there are cases that the, the semen has been positive for longer periods of time, but I don't know how long that is. 
And so I would um, just add that I, I won't go into a, a specific date or length of time, uh, but I encourage you to, to look at CDC's website as we gain more information about this. But I will say uh, more generally that we know that the, the virus does stay uh, in semen for longer period of time than it does in other bodily fluids like blood or, or you know, other, other fluids. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Our last question comes from Lisa. This is a difficult topic to bring up. Do you have any suggestions for starting the conversation with pregnant couples, or is it best to wait for them to approach our health ministers first? So I'll, I'll mention a few things, and Dr. Likos may like to, to add. Um, it is a, a difficult topic to talk about. Uh, but, but I think that we do need to be proactive because we want to uh, protect uh, those, those uh, pregnancies, protect infants from being born with microcephaly. So we do need to be proactive. Uh, there are some tools that are available to you uh, that can help you get the conversation started. Um, as I mentioned, uh, CDC's website has a lot of communication resources, fact sheets, and, and so forth that you can uh, display in your building that you can hand out and encourage people if they have questions to come with those questions and, and talk more about it. Um, you can work with your health department or local doctors to have educational sessions and invite people to come to those and that may get some of those discussions started where they can ask their questions and, and learn more about uh, keeping uh, safe from Zika. And I, I totally agree. I think we do need to be proactive in bringing up the, the topic. And as health ministers, I, I, I would, for you, I would really like to underscore some of the, the ideas that uh, that doctor talked about, and especially the, the community efforts to clean up the neighborhood or drain and cover uh, is our, our Florida message for that. It is so important to be able to get out into your community, and I think one way you can do this to bring up the conversation is to actually start a campaign to clean up uh, neighborhoods within your community. Of, of once a week organizing teams that will go house to house, helping some of the folks that maybe can't get outside and take care of it themselves so much. We really do need that grassroots level of activity in the neighborhoods, in the communities to drain any kind of standing water, to cover any water that can't be drained, to get rid of, of even a little tiny bottle caps that might be collecting a, a drop of water, mosquitoes this particular mosquito will lay its eggs in those very small containers. I, I, a colleague of mine went around with mosquito control in Miami and they were telling me about going to a house where on the back porch was a bird cage with a bird in it and, and as we all want to take care of our pets there was a little cup of water in the bird cage and no one had really thought about changing that water on a regular basis and it was teeming with mosquito larvae. So, so think about everything around your homes and especially also around businesses. Since Zika virus is a very mild illness, what we're finding is that people go to work. Even, even when they're sick, that, that even if they have symptoms, they go to work because it really doesn't make you feel so bad that you feel like you have to stay in bed. So they go to work and we're finding that, our, that uh, places of business are playing a bigger role in transmission of this disease than the home site, which is our usual place of doing epi epidemiological investigation. So anything you can do to help us uh, drain and cover, get rid of uh, mosquito breeding sites will certainly help uh, reduce the transmission of Zika virus in your communities. All right, thank you. This concludes our question and answer session. And thank you, Haley, for moderating that. Well, we um, this basically concludes our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember that as health ministers, you're trusted messengers, first responders, and cultural key holders. And I just want to punctuate what Dr. Liko said. In all of those roles, it is so appropriate for you to practice vector control. And we at the Center for Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships 
are convinced that as you engage in community vector control activities, those complicated, more uh, nuanced conversations will naturally flow because you'll be in close contact working with each other and building that trusting relationship. Um, in our previous national webinar, we had the um, the head of the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships in Puerto Rico talk about solidarity and how important in the time of an epidemic solidarity is. And by doing these community activities and, and practicing these vector control uh, methods, we uh, are confident that you will, you will build that trust, you'll build solidarity, and be prepared for the next uh, whatever public health or other type of uh, health issue comes up in your community. Thanks for joining us. Uh, please visit our the CDC info uh, to get more information on Zika and visit our website at hhs.gov backslash partnerships to get more information on health minister's guides and to uh, see the other guides in this series. Thanks so much for your time with us today and have a great weekend.